If you have a Bible, you may like to turn back to the passage we were reading in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 9. I don't know what it's like to be blind. I did know a friend once who was blind. He wasn't born blind, but he became blind. He was for a little while uh, attending this church. And I often used to try and understand what it was like to be blind. It was hard for him to explain as much as it was hard for me to really understand what it's like to be in a world of complete darkness. The nearest I got to it was when I was training for it to be a teacher and part of the course we did a bit of photography. I went into a dark room, uh, literally the dark room. And if you've never been in one before and it's your first time, it's terrifying. The blackness can be felt. Jimmy was talking about it last week, this, this felt blackness. And of course, we don't experience that much now because of, of our technology and all the lights. It's very hard to get somewhere where it's completely dark. But in that dark room, although I was standing by the door and it was only for a few minutes, it was terrifying. I put my hands up and I couldn't see them until I actually touched them. I couldn't see the door that was just a couple of inches in front of me. And you feel vulnerable, disorientated, frightened. And then the door opened and that chink of light came. It was wonderful being able to see that light again. I guess that's the nearest experience I've got to, uh, to anything assembling blindness. And I was so relieved to be back out in the light again. Well, here's a story, and we can hardly imagine, we'd have to multiply it, what it would be like for someone born blind, with no concept of the world around them. They can't see that sun, they can't see the colors, or anything like that, to be made to see. What a joy that must have been to that man's heart. But you know, there's a spiritual level as well. There's a, uh, uh, this is a picture of what happens when a person becomes a Christian. And we know when you first become a Christian, there's so much joy, isn't it? Sadly, we get used to it to some extent. Well, I want to talk tonight about this man who was able to see, but I've called it blind religion because it not only contrasts a man coming to see and later coming to uh, faith as well, it contrasts Christianity with religion. Religion is not an optional alternative to Christianity. It is a blind road of darkness that leads to despair. And some will say, how can you say that? On what authority can you dare to say that and dismiss all these other religions? I say say it on the authority of the word of God. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means it's the only answer. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, Peter uh, said there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. This is the answer. The light is here in Christianity. Anything else is deceptive and hollow and blind. And we have a story here of religious leaders who show themselves as helpless blind guides. Following uh, this miracle of a blind man as he's brought before this Jewish leaders for further investigation. They are perplexed, aren't they? They are clear, for clearly the man they see can see. And he claims that a man, Jesus, untrained, a wandering preacher healed him but the problem is he did it on the sabbath that's not the only problem that seems to be their main contention at first doesn't it they cannot grasp the obvious answer why not because they are blind and so they turn to other attempts to explain away the obvious and in this passage we have the anatomy of blind religion the, the, the passage naturally falls into three sections and we're going to try and take it that way. I'm going to have to go fairly uh, promptly through this. It's a long chapter, as you can see, and there are many things we could dwell on, but I'm going to resist that temptation to open up uh, things further. So let's have a look at the first section, which is really the actual miracle. A blind man sees. 
you know, this is incredible, isn't it? This would be major news today, wouldn't it? And it, we, we almost get so used to hearing these miracles in the Gospels that we, we shrug our shoulders and just, yeah, great. It's incredible, isn't it? He'd never seen before. Now we can see, and it's through Jesus. And we get that here as Jesus and his disciples are walking along and they see a man sitting down and he's begging and he's obviously blind. His disciples ask this question of him. And it's interesting because it opens up the whole uh, topic about the nature of sin and disease. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that now, but just to say uh, what comes naturally out of this. The disciples ask a curious question, don't they? They say, making this a certain assumption, they say, Rabbi, Jesus, who sinned? They assumed he sinned in, 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 in the sense that this has caused his disease. Who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? He was born blind, so he must have sinned terribly. Now, in a sense, of course, all disease comes from sin because when the world was fallen and sin came into the world, all disease came in. But they were saying that this man particularly did some dreadful sin. Do you remember Job had the same problem with his comforters? They were convinced, Job, you've done something wrong. You're hiding something. And that's why you've got this problem. God is punishing you for some secret sin. And Jesus gives this astonishing answer. He says, neither. This man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. God's glory might be displayed in him. Uh, we need to hold on to that because later on, the Pharisees challenge this man and say, show glory to God. Well, he is showing the glory to, to God or he's the recipient of God's work that will show God's glory. But Jesus doesn't leave it there. What I love about John's gospel is the way he weaves in the themes. He keeps them going because he talks about being the light of the world. We get that here in the, in the next bit. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, uh, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, if you remember last week's sermon, uh, at the beginning, Jesus started with that phrase. If you turn over to chapter 8, you will see it in verse 12. Jesus spoke again. This is after the, uh, the, the last experience um, with the woman caught in adultery. Then we move on and Jesus says this. He spoke to the people, I am the light of the world. Remember, it's the backdrop against the great festival when the lights were all being taken down. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He says it again here. Verse 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And he talks this time about darkness and light. But if you think about it, darkness and light, blindness and sight, they're, they're really related, aren't they? They're, they're talking basically about the same thing. The man who is blind is in effect in darkness. And the man who receives sight receives light. They, they belong together, don't they? And we have here what Jesus is beginning to open up again and restating, I am the light of the world. People are walking in darkness. We have work to do. And he picks up on this idea further when he talks about being unable to work while it's dark. Now, to us, we won't get the full impact of that because many people work during the night. Many people work in the dark. But remember, we're talking about an agrarian economy where most people would have been involved in work outside, uh, the majority of which would have been in the fields and some sort of manual labor. And you didn't do it when nighttime came. You didn't have great lights that you could put on and floodlights and so on to carry on the work. Right up until about uh, midway through the 19th century, it was very much the same thing. People finished work early, they got up early because they had to work with the light. And Jesus is saying, and putting an urgency on his disciples, there is only so much time where there is light. We don't work in the dark. Well, then he goes on and does this amazing miracle. Um, I'm not going to get sidetracked into why he used mud this time, 
but he was able to heal. Jesus can use different methods and he did it sometimes deliberately, sometimes he had reasons for doing it in a certain way. He could of course just touched his eyes, but he chose to do it this way. The man goes to the pool of Siloam and he comes back seeing. Can you just imagine for a moment what that man must have felt? You know, if he'd been blind for a couple of years and then got his sight back, that would be wonderful. But he was seeing the world for the first time like a newborn baby and and the joy that he must have had in seeing that. But he has conflict, doesn't he? We, we find out that his neighbors seem to have all sorts of problems about this sight. And it's incredible. These people knew him. They saw him regularly going to the same spot. And yet some of them doubt whether it's the same man or they doubt whether he was truly able, uh, truly blind. Listen to what he says, what they say here. Um, Jesus has performed this miracle. Verse 8, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging, notice that, those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. Incredible, isn't it? But he himself said, I am the man. Then they say, well, if you are the man, how is it? that your eyes were opened, they asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. You see, even those who knew him, they staring in the, the evidences there for them to see. And they have to come up with these thoughts. Well, perhaps it wasn't him. Perhaps it's somebody else, somebody who looks a bit like him. Or was he faking all along? You know, the idea that a man would sit and beg most of his life uh, rather than get up and have, uh, be able to work and have the freedom of being able to see. But they will not accept what has happened, which is quite incredible when you think about it, isn't it? But it's a reminder to us that we can present the evidence of Christ and feel, well, you know, surely... They've got to believe it. You know, you can get the best apology to come and and put a presentation across and bring your non-Christian friends and still they will not believe. They cannot see. It takes a work of God to do that. And we see this unraveling as we look at the next section where we have the blind Pharisees investigate. And I've called them blind Pharisees as opposed to seeing Pharisees because they show their blindness in various ways. A questioning takes place. It has to be investigated. After all, Jesus healed on the Sabbath and that is a problem for these people. They actually believed that the mud that Jesus had made was work on the Sabbath. There's an irony here, isn't it? The mud was used to Uh, was the mechanical means through which Jesus performed this miracle and yet the mud seems to be very much in the Pharisees' eyes as they can't see. And I want to show here how religion works very much along these principles that we see in the Pharisees. The first thing is in verses 13 to 16 where they start to question him. And they say to him that he's been brought before them and they can see that he's now able to see and there's this claim that he was once blind. And the day on which it was done was, of course, the Sabbath. So the problem becomes this. The Pharisees asked him how he'd received his sight, and he gives them a straightforward answer. He put mud on my eyes, the man said, and I washed them, now I see. And this creates a problem for them. They're divided. Some of them, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. We see here, they were blind to the authority of Jesus. And that is the problem with religion. It's got all sorts of sources of authority. But the one great authority is Jesus. And they can't see it. And that's why they, they, they try to wriggle out of the dilemma they're in because this man is here standing before them and quite clearly he could see. He could demonstrate that he could see. And yet there was this claim by many that he was blind. And Jesus changed him. 
But Jesus is a sinner. Jesus is a nobody. And besides which, he did it on the Sabbath. So it's, that's not possible. You see how they could not see and recognize who Jesus was. They were blind to authority. And so it is true with all religions. They were blind in their prejudice, which follows on closely from that in verse 17 to 25. We see here that they are presented with evidence, as the neighbors were, but even more. Let's just look at it a moment. Verse 17. Then they turned to the blind man. What have you got to say about it? It was your eyes he opened. The man replies, he is a prophet. They still did not believe what he had, that he had been blind and that he had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. So the parents are dragged in. In this, is this your son? They said. They just will not accept it, will they? Now the parents are very cagey about this. They don't want to be too associated with the problem that's brewing. Uh, they know that uh, anyone who identifies the Messiah uh, as Jesus could be thrown out of the synagogue. We, we might not think that's a, a particularly big deal. But the synagogue was the life of community. To be excommunicated from that was a dreadful thing, a very serious matter for anyone living in a community that was more or less ruled by um, the rabbis and the religious leaders and not able to go and worship and to meet. And they give um, some very basic answers. They say, well, two things they, they say. Yes, he is our son. And yes, he was blind. And that presents a real problem, doesn't it? Because that's the very thing these blind leaders do not want to hear. They were hoping perhaps that we say, well, no, he's not really our son. Or, well, he wasn't really blind. Perhaps he could see a little bit or something and it wasn't really a miracle. They have to wriggle out of the dilemma they're in. But he says, they say it's his son. The, the, the man himself has testified that he's been able to see. The neighbors, presumably, who have also gathered are also saying the same thing. The evidence, again, is so clear. It's before them. But prejudice kicks in. Prejudice is when we prejudge something and we're blind to the truth. We see the evidence and we say, I'm still not going to believe it. And maybe you've had conversations with somebody like that and you've presented the arguments and you put it across and they still will not believe. This man gives his own testimony. He says, look, my life has been changed. I'm a, I'm a new man. Then we have that wonderful uh, description where he, he gives it very clearly, doesn't he? He's asked again and he says, uh, the parents have, have gone now. They uh, say, let him speak for himself, and he is of age, verse 24. A second time they summoned him, the man who was blind. Now, this is rather ironic, isn't it? It's a give glory to God. Notice what they say then, by telling the truth. In other words, you're lying. You cannot be telling the truth because you claim that this Jesus can do a miracle, and, and we just cannot take that on board. We will not believe that. So let's stop. Let's give glory to God. Come on, be honest. Uh, what, is, what is it? What's the solution? What are you hiding? And we get this wonderful answer. Very wise answer, it really, isn't it? Uh, they say, he's a sinner. Sinners can't do this. He's a nobody. He replied, verse 25, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. Now, he's not saying Jesus is a sinner. He's just saying, that's beyond me. That's out of my theological depth. I don't understand that. I'm not going to get drawn into it. This is what I do know. This is what I do know. I was blind. But now I see. He gives his testimony. It's really the testimony of all true believers. We may not be able to put together all the precise details of what happened in our life. We may, may not have a dramatic conversion that, you know, we, we went through these terrible, horrific experiences and, and then the Lord came. That's great if you've got that testimony. But never be, um, feel that you're somehow a less of a Christian because you haven't had the big, bright light testimony. If you just, maybe just you've grown up in, in, in a Christian family and it's, 
You can't even put the date on it. It doesn't matter. Can you say this? Once I was blind, but now I can see. It's also quite wise when we get into arguments and we get out of our depth. Rather than try to argue and get yourself in the muddle, you know you can get some very clever people and they get you on the subjects of uh, science and creation or something like that, or the Trinity, and you, you, maybe you can't answer them. You can always say this. Look, I, I can't give you all those answers to that. I wish I could. I know someone perhaps can do, but this is my testimony. Once I was blind, but now I see. No one can take that from you. No one can say, no, that didn't actually happen to you. Because you can say, it is, it's true. Once I was lost, now I'm found. That's the great theme of Amazing Grace, which we're going to sing a little bit later. And so he confirms it, but they still will not believe. Now, it's interesting where they say, give glory to God, because that's exactly what he's doing. If you remember in verse, um, verse 2, where Jesus says, in effect, that he will bring glory to God. He says, uh, this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, yes, he is blind, but I'm going to heal him, and God will be glorified through it. And that is the way God is glorified when we give our testimony, when he, we see things happening in people's lives. These um, blind guides said, give glory to God by towing the line and telling the truth and keeping in line. You know, we know this man, Jesus, cannot do these things, can he? There's a, as I say, there's an irony there, isn't there? So there's this great uh, sense of prejudice. And then further, the blindness leads to ignorance and finally to anger. With ignorance, we get it here where they uh, make their claims to be disciples of Moses. Uh, the man is very brave here, and he starts saying, do you want to be disciples as well? Oh, you can see he's really rubbing them up the wrong way, isn't he? And uh, they are indignant. We are the disciples of Moses. We've heard that somewhere before, haven't we? Do you remember um, when they argue about whose father they were and who they belonged to? We are of Moses. I don't know who this man is. There's a, a slur there intended where they say, he, we don't know where he came from. They're probably making a reference to his father and to his parentage. Of course, we know that Joseph wasn't his father and uh, he came from heaven. Um, he wasn't of this earth in that sense. But there's a, an intended slur there probably that uh, well, we don't even know who he is. We know who we are. We've got our, our roots sorted out. We're of Moses. But Jesus, I mean, who is he? Who's his father? And they, become, they show their ignorance through this. It's, it's interesting how this man, who would have had no education, seems to suddenly grasp things. And he's able to answer them in this way. And they are angry with him. And they cannot accept his response. And they become blind uh, they are blind, so they become angry. Finally, because they cannot answer him, what do they do? They resort to violence. They've asked him, they've questioned him. Then verse 28, they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciples, we are disciples of Moses and so on. The man answered, now that is remarkable, verse 30. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could, not, he could do nothing. It's an amazing answer he's given, isn't it? To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. You see, they're back to this idea that because he was blind, he must be a terrible sinner or his parents had sinned in some terrible way. How dare you lecture us? And they throw him out. They cast him out effectively of the Jewish community. And so he's cast out. Then we get that last section, which I think is lovely and is tender because we have Jesus coming back to him. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, what was happening here? Jesus heard, he sought him out. Jesus was seeking him. 
Jesus does seek and save. He comes to him and he has more to tell him. He's given him uh, physical sight, but the work's not complete yet, is it? Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and found him. He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. He's given some remarkable answers, but he's not, he's not there yet. He doesn't have that faith that he needs. He has physical sight, as I say, but not spiritual sight yet. And then one of the most remarkable verses we get in the whole of the New Testament, Jesus actually declares who he is. Verse 37, Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. So we see Jesus here finishing the work, seeking and saving those who are blind and lost. And that's true still today. This is not just a history story. This is not just something that we can fondly remember from Sunday school days, perhaps, as a great story about Jesus giving sight to a blind man. There's a principle here that goes beyond the story to tell us that this can be true of any of us because without Christ, we are blind. No matter what we can understand about this world, we may have a brilliant mind that can fathom out all kinds of mysteries. If we do not know Christ, we are blind and we will stay blind No other religious teacher can change us. We can't do it ourselves any more than a blind man can make himself see. But Jesus can. And there's a lovely picture here, isn't there, of Jesus going to this man, seeking him out and saving him, helping him to come to that full and complete understanding. But there's also a sting in the tail as well, isn't there? The Pharisees, some of them at least, are still there with him. And uh, they hear of all this. They see this man. He's worshipping. He's probably on his knees in front of Jesus. And Jesus said, for, verse 39, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see. And those who see will become blind. There's a kind of a conundrum here in seeing and blindness again. He's still really on this theme of the light of the world. The Pharisees interject. They don't get what he's saying. And they said to him, What? Are we blind too? Well, of course, they're not physically blind. But Jesus is talking about another blindness, isn't he? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. It's interesting because the man was blind. He was guilty of sin. You remember? They they accused him of sin. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. There is judgment on those who are spiritually blind. Jesus confirms this judgment. I just want to draw to a close with a a challenge and an encouragement. A challenge first to any, you might be listening online, this might seem a hard thing to get hold of. You may be very knowledgeable, very intelligent, very learned. You may not but you, you are fairly assured that you, you know pretty much about things in this world and can give a good argument and you will have a good talk about religion and your views. But on the authority of the word of God, the word of Jesus too, if you do not know him, if you do not follow him, if you do not believe him, you are blind. You are in darkness And worse than that, you are under his condemnation. There is no getting away from it, just as these Pharisees were, unless they were to change. But encouragement for us, if we are believers and we have come to faith, we are able to see. We can understand things that the brightest and smartest of professors cannot grasp. That's an incredible thought, isn't it? We see it already beginning here in this picture, don't we? These were the Pharisees. They were not fools. They were intelligent men. They were learned men. They would not have been in their position if they didn't have brains. They had studied the scriptures. They were the experts. But this blind man who's not had a day's education, never looked at a textbook, never been able to see until that day, 
is able to talk with him. We already see he's beginning to have a, a spiritual sight. He's grasping things that they could not understand. And that should encourage us, whoever we are, however much we might struggle with understanding the big pictures and, and the full information that the, the Bible gives us. If we have this testimony, once I was blind, but now I can see, that doesn't mean to say we leave it there. We must do everything we can to build up our faith. We are encouraged to study it and so on. But that is sufficient to say to anyone, you may have all your answers. You may have all your degrees and diplomas. You may have all your experience. But I have this truth. Once I was blind. I was a sinner. I was lost. I was hopeless and helpless. But now I can see the picture is this man. Think how helpless he was when he started off. He couldn't do anything he but sit and beg and be helped by others with food and various other things, I'm sure. He was completely helpless, like a baby. Now he is able to walk about, to talk, maybe to get a job, to do things for himself, to feed himself, to walk without being led. His life was transformed. And when you become a Christian, of course, that is true. Now, sometimes we lose a little bit of the glow of that, don't we, as Christians? We get bogged down with the problems and we feel a little bit lost and weary. But let's remember that glorious truth. If you are a Christian, you have been transformed. You were blind. You were in this world groping about. You were in that dark room, unable to see, frightened and fearful. What would come upon you? But now you can see. It doesn't matter about the scientists and the philosophers, what they come up with. It doesn't matter what happens in this world even. Ultimately, you are in Christ. That is the securest, the most glorious place to be. And that's not the end of it, is it? There's more to come. There's more glory to come. You know, when we get to heaven, we'll meet this blind man. What a story he'll tell us. And many others, of course. So can I put the challenge to you again? Do you know this? Can you see? Or are you still in blindness? Let's pray. Our oh, Heavenly Father... It's so simple, isn't it? Just this great statement that this man was able to make one day into sight and he could say, I was blind, now I see. And no doubt as he learnt more about Jesus, he could say a lot more than that. But that was sufficient. We pray, Lord, for any who are groping in darkness that you will bring them light. We can't do it, we can't do it for them. But you can. You can do that miracle. And we pray that you would bring spiritual blindness, uh, those who are spiritually blind, bring them to light. Let them see. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.